My name is Howard Edelman. I'm your host for Israel in the Jewish World. November 1st to 9th is Holocaust Education Week. Though I travel to Israel almost every year, I'm ashamed to say that I've not been back to Yad Vashem for a number of years. It was my loss. In our program tonight, we visit a revamped Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Now, it's hard to describe a memorial to the murder of six million Jews as magnificent, but it truly is. It's also the premier education facility concerning the Holocaust. Not only does it have a superb museum, which we'll explore, but it is involved in research, education, exhibitions, and memorials to the righteous of the nations. We will visit an exhibition of art by Holocaust survivors. We'll also discuss with Susanna Kikkonen, who has her own interesting story, Yad Vashem's new program of education aimed at Christians. We'll then reflect with several scholars on the role of remembrance, especially concerning the Holocaust. For like everything else, even memory and memorializing has become controversial. Is it kitsch? Is it wallowing in the past and self-pity? Is Holocaust education a political device to win sympathy for Israel? We'll talk to Martin Maxwell, a survivor and military hero, on the purpose of Holocaust education and his personal role and impact in visiting and talking to school children about the Holocaust and his own experiences. For a change, we will end the show with my being speechless. Instead of the usual wrap and sign off, we will view photographs and paintings of Auschwitz with a minute of silence. Please stay with us. My guest is Ehudi Shendar. She's the deputy director of the museum division of Yad Vashem, and she's also the senior curator. Welcome to the show. You're welcome. Uh, first, give me an overview of the exhibit. This exhibit, for the first time, gives voice to the, vi to the visual utterance. We have heard survivors speak on tape, in video, they've written their testimonies, but we have rarely looked at the art that they have produced. And the visual utterance is so important because usually we speak about the Holocaust as an event undescribable. Unfortunately, it is describable by those who went through the experience, they sure can describe it for us in visual language, in visual syntax, and this is what we have here. And it's organized thematically? How many themes do you have here? We have 11 thematic groupings here, each one dealing with similarities, although each one of them created it alone in his studio, in his room. Together, we hear a voice that we can discern groupings within it. And this is uh, quite an epic kind of painting. Um, and who is this by? His name is Boris Taslitsky, originally from Russia, but resided in Paris from where he was taken to Buchenwald. And what it does here, I like your word epic, because we don't think about epic terms talking about the Holocaust. But when we look here, it reminds us a lot of epic scenes, mainly of form scenes from a very well-known Dutch painter by the name of Reuchel. That's what I thought of immediately, immediately when I saw it. And if you look at this figure here, bending down, you think she's working in the field, tilting the land. He wants to tell you the message. This is a European epic but from a different period, a different time, and different circumstances. So he is inviting you into this large, huge scene, almost human size, 
to tell you, enter this hellish existence. This is what I experienced for the years I was incarcerated at Buchenwald. Yes, because it takes one place and puts various time periods all in one space. Like Bruegel did. It's Bruegel? I always yes. pronounce it Bruegel. Well, but he, that's he's <laughs> Dutch <laughs> and a Jesus. Because when yes. I saw it, I said, Boy, that's like a Bruegel painting. Even the faces, which yeah. are somewhat, um, I would say, satirical, but it's in a manner to show you the harsh life, the harsh reality, and not to leave anything for the imagination, because your imagination is incapable of imagining what is there, but he was there, and thus it is, as I said, describable. And also what comes back to you is the juxtaposition. You get the sense of those old paintings of town scenes and little plays, and it's always market, it's ordinary life, and this is totally other ordinary, uh, extraordinary. Well, what Slitsky wants to tell you and many other artists, that the Holocaust did not take place on another planet. It's Europe the very cultural Europe with its tradition of culture and art, and this wonderful cultural Europe did what it did to the, to the Jews. Now there's another painting here I'd like you to comment on, because this one I don't quite understand. So uh, can you, this, this? Yes, yes, yes. I think also it's an important one. It's a self-portrait. Oh, of a Dutch painter by the name of Elie Neuberger. And Elie calls his painting with a very Christian name, Achashverish. And Achashverish is the wandering Jew who is punished by the Christian to wander around the globe because he has not recognized Jesus. This is a very strong message, saying, I am the wandering Jew now. This is how I came out of the Holocaust, and the Christians are punishing me again. I'm being punished for the fact that I'm a Jew, and he maybe tells us that Christian tradition has maybe something to do with it. But he's a survivor, and behind him we see the white figure. This is Elijah. Elijah, who is the one to have the mercy and to have the ability to take the people together and bring him from darkness into the new life. But also what's interesting, he has this gesture. This gesture says, um, I have a responsibility. I came out of there, mass, many of my fellow Jews did not. I feel ashamed that I was the lucky one, but I feel the responsibility to tell the others what I experienced. And the background is, of course, I assume the fires of the Holocaust Definitely. in that sense. Um, the, the sense of Elijah being behind the wandering Jew, I don't get quite the sense of a resurrecting figure, you know, that it's a resurrecting but it is a protective because he has his arms wrapped around him. Because um, you, you, you suggested that there's something about, I'm a survivor and I have a, a responsibility to, to tell the story, but the protection of telling the story needs protection or is Israel the, needs protection? I don't, I'm not sure of the message, you see. Well, the fact that he survived, somebody has protected him. I see, so. He had someone, an entity, he personifies it by Elijah, that protected him while others did, were not protected. And he feels this protection around him when he comes out of the Holocaust, almost with nothing on himself. Okay, there's another painting over here I want you to comment on. The, it's the Harlequin figure with the train. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, I, I'm very attracted to this because uh, my daughter's a painter. And she has one big, huge painting, which we bought of her painting, which has a salt and pepper har Harlequin figures. And the painting, nobody can figure out what it is. It's a huge painting. It's really a macrophage inside the body, trapping uh, an invasive bacteria. 
Hmm. That's, but you can't tell what it is. It took it from a slide. So here it's a kind of self-protection uh, against an invader, but always the humorous comment of these two salt and pepper Harlequin figures. Now this is a more powerful one because of course the train and the fire, you get the sense of ominous and yet the Harlequin figure, but I don't know why I'm puzzled by it, but I am. Because it's a puzzling scene of a Harlequin, which is a kid, yeah. that's number one. Harlequin is this sad clown who has the tears coming down, but it's never a kid. So first of all, it's the kid. The second part of it is that the landscape is no landscape. It is gray and flat, there's nothing. There's no, you, you don't get a sense of a sky, of, a, of some perspective, it's all blocked. But you have a little kid sitting there in awe. And I think it becomes clear when we know what um, the biography of the artist is. His name is Paul Cor. He is from Paris. And after the Nazi invasion, like many other Jews, he fled southward. And while the family was on, its, on the road, his father remembered he forgot something. No, so no. Oh. He, went, he went back into the apartment, was caught, put on a train to Drancy, and from Drancy to Auschwitz, murdered there. And Paul Kohl remains, he was 10 years old at the time no matter how much he matured throughout his life he remains the little kid that a train a flaming train left him alone in a bare world with no mercy that's what it shows no mercy and paul cora also wrote many children books for israeli kids with illustrations and so in a way, he was a clown telling stories, but he I wanted see, to I tell you, I I'm still the little kid who lost his father in a fiery train, and I'm a sad Arlequin. And why is this back to you rather than sort of a side figure where you can see the tears coming down? Is there something significant that it's the backside you see? And is there some... Because, you know, I couldn't understand also the proportions, because you don't have the legs, uh, you know, shown. Is it deep grass? It's, you know, it's uh, very ambiguous for me. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Ambiguity raises question. Mm -hmm. If it's all there, there's nothing to speak about. So ambiguity is there. I think he wants to say that he, he was frozen in time. It's a very static, static. Oh, right? Right. Yes. right. I'm there. That's how I was left. A little kid at all at what the world has done to me. And even his hair, if you can see, yeah. is an echo. His hair is still the fiery hair, hair. like the fire in and the, the tree. And the cone cap is the kind of clowny. Exactly. Hair. And if you look at the grayish, it's very much like um, dust like ashes. Oh, like that's right. It's ashes. very ashy. It's all this gray of ashes. Well, that's what his father ended up being. Ashes it's a very powerful painting. I agree. It's very powerful. There's another one over on the other side. I also so don't understand go. at all. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry to bring up all the ones I don't understand. <laughs> 